Okay, so now we're going to start a discussion of dipole moments and how to determine whether a molecule is polar or not. Now, before we get started, let's just remind ourselves of a few things. And remember that chemical bonds are formed by overlapping orbitals, and these are a force that bind atoms together. And they either form molecules or ionic compounds, put simply. Chemical bonds overall, they form because the energy of the bonded atoms is less than these atoms would have separately. And so that's the driving force for forming chemical bonds, this lower energy, this reduced energy. Now also remember that atoms form bonds with other atoms to attain a noble gas configuration. And so we've discussed two main types of bonds. One is ionic bonds and the other one is covalent bonds. Now, ionic bonds we're going to set to the side until a little bit later, or perhaps you've already gone through the discussion of ionic bonds, but now we're going to focus on covalent bonds. And there are two types of covalent bonds, either polar or nonpolar. Okay, so let's talk about nonpolar covalent bonds first. Now, basically, these are formed between atoms that have relatively equal electronegativity or the exact same electronegativity. So for instance, if the two atoms of the same element are bonding together, then they would have the same electronegativity, and that would definitely be a nonpolar covalent bond. But we even say that bonds between atoms such as carbon and hydrogen, between these elements, we call those nonpolar covalent bonds also. So there is a small difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen, but we would say that that's essentially a nonpolar covalent bond. And in these bonds, electrons are shared equally between the atoms involved in the bond. So the electron density is basically very similar. Now, polar covalent bonds are distinctly different from this, okay? So they're distinctly different in that now we have a bond between an element with a higher electronegativity than the other. Now, we're not talking about electronegativity differences that are so high that one of the elements or atoms of that element steals an electron from the other and forms an ionic bond. We're just talking about one with higher electronegativity than the other. And this means that these electrons are shared unequally between the atoms involved in the bond. So the electrons are now, instead of being shared equally because they have the same electronegativity, now one, the more electronegative atom is greedy and pulls the electron density toward itself. And so we can show this with a picture right here. Um, so here we can see this larger electron density. So this is the electron cloud around this oxygen in this carbon-oxygen bond. So we could even say that this could be carbon monoxide, for instance. And so the electron density would be polarized toward oxygen because it's more electronegative, and it draws that electron density toward itself and away from the carbon in the bond. And so this results in this partially positive charge here on the carbon and this reduced electron density around carbon the electron density is much higher around oxygen with the partial negative charge on oxygen. So that's what's going on in a polar covalent bond. The oxygen is pulling electron density toward itself, resulting in a partial negative. Since it's pulling electron density away from carbon, it results in a partial positive charge on carbon. So this asymmetrical charge distribution creates something called a dipole moment. And we represent a dipole moment with the Greek symbol mu. Now, often we want to just indicate that there's a dipole moment, and we don't want to draw this electron cloud around our molecule. And if we want to indicate a dipole moment, then we're going to use an arrow that's always going to point toward the more electronegative element in the bond and or toward the excess negative charge and you can see this you know the end of the arrow kind of looks like a plus so put the plus on the partial positive end of the molecule with the arrow pointing pointing toward the more negative part of the molecule or the more electronegative atom so this is a way that like i say we can simply 
indicate that there is a dipole moment in this bond, okay? So let's think of this, first of all, as a, this can be a bond dipole, and if it's carbon monoxide, it would also be a molecular dipole. And that's where we're going with this discussion. We want to talk about molecular dipoles and how can we find those. One thing we need to ask ourselves is, do all molecules with polar bonds have an overall molecular dipole? And what we're going to discuss here is that they actually, it doesn't mean that they do. Sometimes a molecule can have polar covalent bonds, but still not have an overall molecular dipole. So we need to figure out how to determine when that is happening and when there actually is an overall molecular dipole. So let's take a look at water and carbon tetrafluoride. So water is polar, carbon tetrafluoride is nonpolar. So this is the spoiler alert. So let's look at how we figured that out. Now, this is just a, you know restating a little bit of what we've talked about already. So molecules can have polar covalent bonds and they may have an overall molecular dipole, but they don't necessarily have to have one. Now, in order to figure out if the molecule actually does have an overall dipole, we have to graphically add the individual bond dipoles together. And when we do this, we have to take into account the geometry of the molecule. So if you don't take this geometry into account, you could easily be led down the wrong path and get the wrong answer on whether this molecule has a molecular dipole. So how do we do that? All right, so the first thing we're going to do when we want to figure out if there's an overall molecular dipole moment present is draw the molecular ge geometry according to VSEPR. Okay, so that's our first step. So if you want to figure out if a molecule has a dipole moment, and we're going to use this information later on heavily when we talk about intermolecular forces, but the first thing we want to do is draw this molecule with using VSEPR and show that geometry. So we can see that water, we're going to end up with a bent shape, okay, and carbon tetrafluoride, we're going to end up with a tetrahedral shape. Now let's look at the polar bonds in each of these molecules. Okay, so oxygen hydrogen bond, that's a polar bond, okay, and water has two of them. And carbon is bonded to fluorine, and of course fluorine is much more electronegative than carbon. So we want to draw these bond dipole moment arrows onto these molecules. So let's start with water. Okay, now remember the arrow has to point toward the more electronegative atom, and the little plus here goes on the partial positive, and so these bond dipoles are pointing toward the oxygen. And see how they're both pointing in the general up direction? So we're going to see how to show that in just a few minutes. So that's water. Now let's look at carbon tetrafluoride next, and here the partial positive is going to be on this carbon, so electron density is being drawn away from the carbon toward the fluorine, and it's happening on all four of these bonds equally. Okay, so these are all equivalent bonds, all right, carbon fluorine bonds, and the dipole moment is pointing toward fluorine in each one of them. Now, the next thing we want to do in order to figure out whether this molecule has an overall molecular dipole is to figure out whether all the bond dipole moments cancel. There's a couple of things you can look for here. One, if they are 180 degrees opposed to each other, both pointing in, you know, in opposite directions, 180 degrees, you're going to see pretty easily that those cancel. All right, I haven't put up an example like that in this particular presentation, but you know, it's easy to see how those would cancel out. Now, when you have a molecule that is bent, for instance, like water, see these bond dipoles do not cancel. See how well, they're both pointing up, but at an angle, and they don't cancel each other out. And so when we look at this molecule, and we can see basically that we have a bond dipole on each side pointing toward oxygen. And they're not equally opposed, and so overall water has a dipole moment. Now, 
carbon tetrafluoride is different. And this one's a little bit harder to see, but this molecule ends up being nonpolar because all of these bond dipoles cancel. Here's just a little restatement for water. Both of them are pointing toward oxygen. No other dipoles offset, but carbon tetrafluoride, they're all equal bond dipoles and they're pointing away from each other. Now, it's hard to see, but see how this bond dipole is pointing straight up in the air, okay? All of these are at an angle. And remember, this is, so this would be a tetrahedral shape. So these, this is gonna be kind of pointing down and this carbon would be raised up off of the surface of the table, for instance. So if we were to lay this molecule on the desktop, it would make kind of a little pyramid. Each one of these bond dipoles, if you add all of those vectors together, they're pointing generally down in the down direction. This one's pointing straight up, but all three of these taken together do cancel this one out. And one of the ways that you can recognize when this is happening is that this is a symmetrical molecule. So all of the bonds are equivalent. It's a tetrahedral molecule and all of those bond dipoles cancel because all of the bonds are the same. Now, that would not be true, for instance, if we were to take this fluorine and put a hydrogen there. All of a sudden, this dipole would not be canceled out by these two and this carbon-hydrogen bond. So it's because all of the bonds are the same that this cancels out. All right, so let's show the overall dipole moment on water. Okay, so this is how we would show that. We would just draw an arrow in the up direction, the overall molecular dipole pointing up the way we have it drawn. And just, you know, to remind ourselves that since carbon tetrafluoride has a tetrahedral geometry and it's symmetrical, so all of the polar bonds point away from the central carbon, they're all equal all the same bond, then all those bond dipoles cancel out, and overall, carbon tetrafluoride is a nonpolar molecule. It still has polar bonds, but all those bond dipoles cancel out to result in a nonpolar molecule. Okay, so just in summary, molecules with bond dipole moments may or may not have an overall molecular dipole, so you have to draw the molecule out with using VSCPR, add all the bond dipoles, and look to see if they were are going to cancel out. And if the bond dipole moments don't cancel, then this molecule will be polar. And generally, these molecules will be asymmetric. Some molecules with bond dipoles do not have an overall molecular dipole moment, and so carbon tetrafluoride was an example of that. There we have all of the same polar bond, the molecule is symmetrical, all the bonds are the same, and all of those bond dipole moments cancel out. So watch for a few more examples. I'll be posting the kind that you know I write on the whiteboard screen, and we'll do a few more examples of this type of determining the overall molecular dipole moment for molecules. In other words, determining whether a molecule is polar or not.